Thank you for joining today's presentation with Stojanovic and Associates. My name is Daniela Stojanovic and I'm the Director and Registered Migration Agent for Australia. At Stojanovic and Associates, we are basically a one-stop shop to cater for all our clients' needs so they don't have to sort different companies to help them meet certain criteria in order to be able to apply for the visa. So we obviously do migration services, which is everything from giving you advice, reviewing your circumstances, applying for the visa, guiding you through the process. If there's a refusal, going to the tribunal. We assist those that are um, unlawful in Australia who have had past visa refusals. If anyone has health or character problems, citizenship inquiries and obviously ministerial intervention as well. So we basically specialise in immigration as a whole and this can be quite an advantage for a person that uses our services because we are able to map out a pathway for them how they can go towards meeting their goals of obtaining permanent residence. Some people have the opportunity to go straight for permanent residence and others obviously have to go through the temporary resident pathway first. However, this is discussed at the, uh, at the, during the consultation stage and we are able to advise you what your steps would be. Then we offer skills assessment services. So that's mainly for skilled and work visas and we have someone that's quite skilled in this area and that's all they do within our company. So they can review your CV and educational qualifications and can determine whether or not you would be eligible to apply for a skills assessment, which is a lot cheaper than going straight for a skills assessment and then getting refused and having to pay more money to have this reviewed. We then offer PT and CCL training. This is not only for work visas, but skilled visas and basically PTE is a form of English testing. Everybody is aware of IELTS. There is also TOEFL, Cambridge, OET, um, but with our research, we believe that PTE is probably the most stable and consistent test, which is why we have a person who is highly trained and skilled in assisting people meet their goals in obtaining scores. So that's important because this person who's our PTE trainer can in actual fact determine based on your results where your weaknesses are and how many sessions in actual fact you need in order to be able to sit your test and get your results. So far we've had a lot of luck with that and hopefully we can continue. The CCL is really great because with the skilled migration program you can get an additional five points and people always say what is an extra five points? Well five points can tip you over the line in becoming more favourable or um, more of an advantage to you when it comes to being selected in the migration skilled process. CCL means Community Credential Language and basically with that if you speak a second language you can get additional points. It's a little bit like sitting the English test but in your own language and I always tell my clients that no matter how good you are at speaking your mother tongue unless you know how the test works and what they assess you on there's a lot of people that actually pay money for this test and end up not passing and then having to get training. So it's always important to have training first so that you know what to expect when you go in there because it is in actual fact an expensive test. I do get people ask me if we speak more than one language, can we see more than one test and get more points? The answer is no. Pick the language that you are strongest in and do the test in that language. We then offer relocation services. So relocation services is quite an important step out of all the services that we offer, especially if you have no support in Australia being family and friends. So we can greet you at the airport, help find a rental property before you come, um, help, I guess, establish you. So getting tax file numbers, driver's licenses, opening up bank accounts. You know, we even go grocery shopping with our clients so they know, you know, why certain items are more expensive than others. Because when you move countries, it is quite a shock. And then when it comes to the standard, um, you'll be more comparing to, in my home country, it's a lot cheaper than buying something here. But you need to understand that you'll be living the Australian standard of life and that usually our prices do match up with our standard of living. However, even then, when comparing one product with the prices, you need to know why something is more expensive than the other. We do spend a day with our clients 
showing them tourist attractions in the state that they choose to live in and hopefully it is a positive start to their journey in migrating to Australia. We also offer conveyancing services. Conveyancing means when somebody buys and sells property, we organise the legal transaction behind that. So if you're looking at buying property, we would obviously review your contracts for you before you sign and negotiate any conditions and then run the process up until your property is transferred into your name. We do the same with selling. We do have a one-stop shop with that where we can assist you with finding a buyer's advocate, a mortgage broker, um, if you need a carpenter or some or a landscaper to do renovations once you buy. So we do have a team that we work with that can assist you all the way. It's not just about us doing the legal transaction and we are obviously happy to help. The conveyancing part is quite important for those that do business and investor visas because when it comes to permanent residency in particular, you do need to be able to tick off that box and show a certain value that you've actually purchased property. For the purposes of today's presentation, we will be discussing business visas. We'll be touching on investor visas because the migration program is quite similar when it comes to the points test and uh, we will notify you during the presentation what relates to the investor part, but the main focus will be about business visas. In the business investor category, there are five different categories. So the first is the business innovation visa, which are those that have a history of running a business and obviously want to buy an existing business or create a new business within Australia. We then have the investor visa, and there's a few different categories of that. So the investor visa, you do need to invest a minimum of 1.5 million in specific areas that Australia requires. And then you have the significant investor visa, um, where the minimum is 5 million, and then you have the premium investor visa, which is a minimum of 15 million. Now, obviously, depending on which investor visa you go for, um, the more you obviously invest into Australia, the easier or some requirements won't be there that will assist you in obtaining the visa. And then you have the entrepreneurial visa where you may have a great idea in specific industries that Australia requires and you may be able to obtain this sort of visa. As you can see with the business innovation visa, it is based on a points-based system, similar to the skilled migration program. And you can see that you do get high points being between the age of 40 and 45 in comparison to the skilled migration program where in actual fact you would only have 15 points. I believe that the immigration department is aware that business owners um, can only be I guess highly skilled and that this comes with age. It's not something that you know a person of 18 years of age could have severe amount of experience. So if you are between the ages of 18 and 24 you do get 20 points. If you are between 25 and 32, you get 30 points. If you are between the age of 33 and 39, you get 25 points. If you are between the ages of 40 and 44, you get 20. And if you are between the ages of 45 and 54, you get 15. Now, usually people that are over 55 are not selected for this program. However, when nominating a state in which you wish to invest and have a business, some states do allow you to be over 55 years of age if what you intend to do in, in Australia is quite beneficial to that particular state. However, you will not be avoid, uh, you won't be awarded any points for age. So that's a little bit of a disadvantage because you need to make up points elsewhere and you do need to have a minimum amount of 65 points to be selected for the program. The next step is the English. So if you have vocational English, you get five points. And if you get proficient English, you have 10 points. Vocational English is actually like five on IELTS or 36 points on PTE. And proficient English is like seven on IELTS and about 69 points on PTE. This is going back to the second slide that we put about offering the 
PTE services, which is helping you gain these points because you need to have, for example, if you're going for the proficient English, 7777 in all four categories being reading, writing, listening and speaking and overall seven. You can't have six in one and the rest you have seven because you will not get the points. Instead, you would be avoided, you would be awarded the five points for vocational because obviously you have more than five in each category. So the aim is to get the equal amount of numbers or more um, in all the four categories. With respect to the educational qualifications, if you have a trade certificate, diploma or bachelor degree um, by an Australian education institution or a bachelor qualification, which means that can be overseas, you get a, you only get awarded five points, which is not much. Under the skilled migration program, having a bachelor degree, you actually get 15 points. Um, so obviously their main focus when it comes to the business visa is not so much your education background, but more your experience within the business. Then you can see you get 10 points if you hold a bachelor degree in business science or technology. So most people that own businesses do have a bachelor or masters of business administration, which is quite useful. Um, obviously having a degree in science or IT is also welcome and that would give you 10 points. When it comes to the financial assets, if your business has not less than 800,000, you get five points. If your business has 1.3 million or more, you get 15 points. If your business has more than 1.8 million, you have 25 points. And obviously if your business has more than 2.25 mil, you get 35. Now the 2.25 mil is quite important in making up the points for those people that are over 55. Remember, if you're over 55, you get zero points. So you do need to score maximum points in other categories in order to be able to get the 65 points. With respect to the business turnover, you're not allowed to have less than 500,000. So if you have 500,000 or more, you get five points. If you have 1 million or more, it's 15. If you have 1.5 million or more, that's 25. And obviously if you have 2 million or more, that gives you 35. Again, as you can see, simply just having the financial assets and the business turnover at 2 million or above, you're already sitting at 70 points. So those that are over 55 don't really need to worry about their age and getting zero points. What they do need to worry about and focus on is trying to score maximum points in other categories and obviously finding a state that has the age exemption, which means they're willing to sponsor you being over 55 and you are able to meet the state requirements in order for that to happen. When it comes to the business innovation stream, you have to have the business for at least four years in the last five years, and that'll give you 10 points. If you've held the business for seven years in the last eight years, you get 15 points. As I told you at the very beginning, the investor stream is quite similar to the business innovation stream because it's still based on points. And instead of meeting the points for the business innovation stream, which I've just spoken about, those that are going for the investor stream visa have a different criteria to meet, which is hold eligible investments of at least 100,000 Australian dollars for no less than four years, you get 10 points and no less than seven years, you get 15. So the only difference is with the investor visa, you need to obviously prove that you've held investments and with the business visa that you actually have been running and owning a business. You can get an extra 10 points by the state that you're looking at moving to if you are able to prove that your idea is not only unique, but an important benefit to the state that you wish to set up your business in. There are other ways to get additional points. Obviously the slide before this one has the main categories that need to be met, and then you can obtain additional points, which you can see on this page. So if you have patents or designs registered not less than one year before um, the activities were run in your main business, you get 15 points. Those that have trademarks registered for not less than one year before the day-to-day -day activities of the main business is 10 points. So they want to see that you've done this before you've actually started running your business. 
and ownership in a day-to-day -day participation in the management of one or more main businesses operated under a formal joint venture agreement entered into no less than one year before this time, that's 15 points, and ownership interest in the main business that derives no less than 50% of its annual turnover from export, that's 15 points, and obviously you can see there you get 10 points for ownership interest in main business not less than five years, and that your average gross turnover was greater than 20% over a continuous three fiscal years. Now, you also get 10 points for having ownership in a main business that received a grant from a government body in your home country of at least 10,000 Australian dollars for the purposes of early phase startup of a business, product commercialization, business development or business expansion, or venture capital funding of at least 100,000 no more than four years before the time of you obtaining the invitation for the purpose of early phase startup of a business, product commercialization, business development, or business expansion. So these, I guess, are a little bit more advanced points when it comes to business owners and how they run their business. Let's face it, not all business, over, uh, business owners do register patents, trademarks, etc. unless I guess they're franchising their business out. But if you do have any of these, um, or you, know, you can work towards some of these that may assist you with the process. Again, the first slide is more important with what's required to be met rather than this. This we can call just a, an added bonus if you can meet some of these. This is probably the most important part amongst meeting the criteria for the visa, because even if you meet the criteria of the visa, if you don't have a state that's willing to nominate you, um, then obviously you won't be able to apply for the visa. So the process is we lodge an expression of interest showing immigration that you can meet the 65 minimum points. We then apply to the state that you wish to set up your business or take over an existing business. You also need to meet their criteria in addition to the criteria that you need to meet for the visa. Now, if they select you, that's when we get an invitation to actually apply for the visa, and this is called a letter of offer. You will have a specified time frame to make the application, and then you simply wait for the process to be finalised before you can come out on the temporary business visa. You cannot apply direct for permanent residence. You do have to go through the temporary visa first and after a minimum of three years, you can apply for permanent. If you find that you cannot meet the criteria for permanent residence during these three years, we can ask for an extension for a further two, which will assist you. Um, but obviously, an advantage of using our services in comparison to other registered migration agencies. Once you get your visa, um, we are still in contact with you all the way through to guide you. We'll remain in contact with you to make sure you're on the right track and to obviously remind you and, and help you by giving you advice on how to meet the criteria in order to get permanent residence. Because the last thing we want is you wasting more time, which is the extra two years to get permanent, and money, of course, and obviously have a direct pathway for permanent residence. But of course, with that comes a lot of planning and making sure that you tick the boxes towards meeting the permanent resident requirements. Now, each state has their own requirements. And out of all the states, based on our research and experience, Western Australia seems to be very strict and competitive to other states. And the reason for this is they're basically allowing you to set up a business or take over a business in any sort of industry, um, which is why they're probably looking at more at you having, I guess, higher than the minimum of 65 points and what it is that you have to offer for their state. So I'm finding the other states are a little bit more easier to meet rather than Western Australia, although it's not impossible. We just need to probably have a consultation to see um, what your ideas are and which state would be best for what your intentions are. As mentioned in the previous slide, each state has their own set of requirements. Some of them are similar, some of them are quite different, uh, depending on the state needs. And just a brief summary, this obviously doesn't include all the requirements for each state that we'll be mentioning in a minute. 
we just picked out the, I guess, main points that you would need to know. So you must be under the age of 55 to be sponsored by Victoria. We can obviously put in a request for an age exemption, but other states are advertising whether or not they accept this, to be honest. You must have a minimum of 65 points. You must have at least vocational English, which is that basic five on IELTS or 36 on PTE. You must have a bachelor degree in engineering, IT, medicine or mathematics, or alternatively hold a master's of business administration. Now, this is funny because before when I spoke to you about the points um, with the qualification, engineering wasn't one of the things that was on the list. It was IT science management. Uh, so as you can see, certain states may ask for additional things. Um, in comparison to what the visa requirements are. So it's not actually a streamlined process. To me, it's a little bit contradicting. The state wants one thing, the visa process wants another thing. So we need to really focus and be above board and up to date as to what each state wants, because without state sponsorship, you will not be able to get this sort of visa. The key industries that Victoria is looking at is digital technology, advanced manufacturing, health and life sciences, food, new energy priority precincts. Victoria is quite interested in those that can establish an export business and be able to determine an export value, create jobs in the Australian local market, and obviously fill in the market gaps that we currently have. As previously mentioned, we're only really telling you some of the requirements for each state as we have a limit when it comes to this presentation. So we'll only be notifying you of, I guess, interesting and important facts you need to know in determining which state you would like to go into. Obviously, this is just general information and each individual that is interested would need to have a consultation so we can specifically provide advice and tailor make a pathway for you. Now, for those that wish to go to New South Wales, where the capital is Sydney, um, regardless of the visa requirements, You need to decide whether you're prepared to live and run a business in the regional area or you do want to be in the city, which is Sydney. In order for New South Wales to sponsor you, you would need you would be required to invest at least $1 million in the business that you're looking at setting up. And that's if you want to be living in Sydney, for example. And if you're prepared to go to regional, then they only require you to invest a minimum of 500000 As previously mentioned, with Western Australia, where the capital is Perth, they're not so much in, uh, interested in what industry you are looking to invest and run a business. What they are looking for, as mentioned before, and I did stress the point that they are quite competitive compared to the other states, is obviously the amount of points you have. So those with the highest points will obviously be selected first, even though the law states that you do only need to have a, a minimum of 65 points. So as advised, you do really need to try hard and focus on that particular state that you wish to go to and what their requirements are amongst obviously meeting the minimum of 65 for the visa process. Now, ideas are important. You need to show them what sort of idea you have in wanting to set up a business because they don't care what industry you're looking at, I guess, setting up a business or taking over a business, but they are interested in what you can offer their state and what that can do for Western Australia. They also want you to prove how well you have re researched the lifestyle in Australia and obviously more, in, more particularly with Western Australia. So by doing this, um, even though the business visa really should be focused on what you can do business-wise for the state, they're trying to test you out to see whether you've done research of what your life would be like in Western Australia in particular. Capital is South Australia, where the capital is Adelaide. This is probably more of the favourable states for those that are over 55. And if, with, this, with respect to the investor stream, if you're willing to invest 5 mil, as opposed to the 1.5 mil that's required for the visa process, where you get the points, um, they're willing to sponsor you for this sort of visa. When it comes to the business innovation visa, they too have categories and requirements like minimum age, what your sort of, I guess, take or objective is with Adelaide and how you can help them increase workers, filling market gaps, etc.
all states, to be honest, are more focused on using the Australian labour market to export products so that the money is coming into Australia rather than importing and anything that Australia is importing, whether or not we can turn that around to set up this sort of product in Australia or make it into exporting rather than importing. Queensland where the capital is Brisbane. Queensland may sponsor you for a business visa if you are interested in a small retail business such as a convenience store, cafes or restaurants. However, this is only accepted if you are planning to do business in regional. So there are some states that are making I guess the requirements a little bit more easier and not having to get into industries that are probably more high tech, high tech like digital technology, for example, advanced manufacturing, um, by promoting regional areas. So those that are okay to go to regional and are looking at possibly setting up or taking over a cafe, restaurant or a convenience store, um, Queensland would be the state for you. Northern Territory, unfortunately, is probably one of the least states that people want to go to, um, but they're the ones with the most lenient requirements, to be honest, both for, I guess, the business visa and for the skilled migration program. So the capital is Darwin. Uh, Northern Territory can waive the age requirement, which is you must be under the age of 55, which means they will allow you to move to their state if you are over 55 so as so long as you can prove to them that you can contribute benefit and deliver business to the state the sort of industries that they are interested in in particular is exporting and assisting in remote areas particularly in healthcare education tourism and fishery you must be able to affect other industries within the sectors of northern territory that can also benefit from your business and if your business can assist with export or replace import products or services, this is also highly looked upon. They will also look at whether or not you can generate business where you can hire Indigenous people, because obviously there is a lot of unemployment in that area and they're trying to encourage employment in this sector. So those that are over 55, South Australia and Northern Territory seem to be more favourable to you. Again, meeting Northern Territory state requirements looks a little bit more relaxed if you can show some of these factors. In comparison to other states, Australian Capital Territory, where the capital of Australia actually Canberra is, um, they don't require much investment value into setting up or taking over a business in comparison to other states. And as you can see, you must invest at least $200,000 in order to establish or purchase a business in Canberra. Tasmania, which is an island just under Victoria. And it's funny, a lot of people say, do we need a visa to travel to Tasmania? And the answer is no, Tasmania falls a part of Australia and you can travel, which is considered domestic and not international. The capital of Tasmania is Hobart. Now, in order for Tasmania to sponsor you, as you can see, there isn't many criterias. Um, and it's quite similar to Canberra or Australian Capital Territory. You need to invest at least $200,000 in an existing or setting up a business. You must genuinely want to live in the state. Obviously, you need to prove to them that you are interested in investing and are serious about sticking to Tasmania during the process, as obviously Tasmania will be sponsoring you and expects you to be loyal in return and to remain there um, all the way until you get your permanent residency. You must be able to demonstrate that you have a successful record in business activity. So they want to make sure that the person that they nominate does have a successful history in running a business and being able to make a profit, which in turn would obviously mean that you would be hiring people from the Australian local labour market and be able to make money for the state. In one of the other slides, there is a pathway to permanent residency from the temporary process. You must hold, or in certain cases, must have held the business or investment visa. Um, sometimes they do allow you to have other visas, as you can see there. If you've had the 
business innovation temporary visa and you can't meet the criteria and you had to then do an extension for a further two, this will also allow you to apply for permanent residency if you hold a special category visa, in some circumstances possibly even a 457 working visa. Ideally to not complicate things and have to prove additional paperwork, you do want to stick with the direct pathway which is either holding an investor or business innovation visa and then moving towards meeting the requirements for permanent residence. Not only to avoid delays, um, but obviously additional costs that you would otherwise use in your business to advance it. You must be able to meet the business requirements and you must have a nomination again for the state that you are in. I really hope that everyone is safe during this unfortunate COVID pandemic. Um, I must say that in our experience, there are a lot of people that are struggling to come in, even with the most unfortunate circumstances, because although they can get the visa, the problem is now getting this travel exemption that allows you to cross the Australian borders. The best thing about the business or the investor visa stream categories is if you obtain such a visa, you actually don't need to apply for a travel exemption. You are automatically exempt and it means that you can enter Australia as though there was no pandemic to begin with. We have a few office locations and a process of expanding. We have office locations in Melbourne, Sydney and Perth and we are in the process of opening up office locations in Dubai, Auckland and New York. As you can see below are also ways of contacting us through our website, email, Skype, Facebook and WhatsApp. We do also have WeChat which is the same mobile number as our WhatsApp and likewise for Viber. So there are many ways of getting in contact with us. Um, we do prefer email, although if you feel more comfortable with contacting us in another way, that is also fine. Don't worry so much about the time difference. We work quite well and understand time difference. So we will do our best to accommodate you and assist you throughout the process. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for listening to our presentation and we do hope to hear from you soon or in the near future in assisting you with your dreams and goals of investing and starting or purchasing a business within Australia and look forward to assisting you with this journey. Just remember it may be hard but nothing is impossible. Thanks for your time. All right. So um, previously, um, Daniela has some issue with the audio right um, earlier, but can you hear us right now, uh, Ms. Daniela? Are you still unable to hear the audio? I guess um, there's still a problem with the audio of her device, but if there's anyone who would like to connect with our speaker, um, if there's any clarification you would like to ask from her, you can always visit their booth at the arena. Let's look for the booth of Stojanovic and Associates. Her email address is also presented in the chat box. You can um, copy your email address and send her any, commu any communication you would like to have. She also put it in the Q&A tab right there. And so you can reach out to her um, any day, anytime you want. So I guess um, that's it for everyone. Thank you very much for your time. And we'll see you in the next session.